Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Nicola Barrett, uh, Chief Corporate oh, Go Braves. <laughs> 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 I'm Nicola Barrett, Chief Corporate Learning Officer at Emory Executive Education at Goizueta Business School. And thank you so much for joining us uh, this morning for Business Over Breakfast. Over the last few years, leaders have been encouraged and challenged to be more empathetic. Uh, in fact, in late 2020, uh, Emory Executive Education conducted some research with senior executives to find out what was top of mind and two things came back, empathy and growth. They were the top two concerns. Today, we're bringing these together in a session we've titled Unlock Innovation from Customers with Scott Sanchez, one of our affiliate faculty. Uh, this research actually spawned a new way of thinking and framing the work we do with organizations that we call growth leadership where we really help organizations develop leaders who can see growth opportunities ahead of the competition, develop skills to design and configure a value proposition with a distinct advantage, unlock market demand, and then execute to capture the value and do this year on year systematically. And Scott's one of the uh, faculty who work with us on that. Um, Scott is a human-centered, a human-driven product innovation leader uh, with expertise in innovation, product management, and design, and a history of turning deep human insights into simple yet impactful products and experiences that delight customers. Scott posits that we can and should use empathy to not only understand customers better than they know themselves, but also to unlock latent demands and needs on which we can build a new products, new services, and new businesses. He's the dad of two kids, a 13-year-old son and a seven-year-old daughter, both of whom learn design thinking at school. So this is an approach that Scott not, in, not only gets to practice at work, but sounds like you get to practice this at home too. Um, Scott brings his expertise to Emory Executive Education courses like Design Thinking for Business Innovation and Disrupting Your Business Strategy, as well as our work on growth leadership with organizations. Today, uh, this morning, Scott's going to spend about 30 to 40 minutes exploring empathy as a way to unlock innovation, followed by uh, some time for questions. So we invite those. Please put them either in the Q&A section or in the chat at the bottom of the screen and we'll do our best to get to as many of those as possible. So enjoy the time with uh, Scott. I look forward to continuing the conversations with you all on April 19th when we welcome back Andrea Dittman to share her research on trust, another critical issue that uh, leaders are all facing. So over to you, Scott. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, Nicola, without a doubt. I'm thrilled to be here today to talk a little bit about empathy and how we can use it to not just, as Nicholas said, not just understand people, but actually figure out how to leverage that and turn it into things, uh, whether it's a new product, a new service, a revised experience, et cetera, all of those things. So very excited to talk about that today. And what I really hope as we go through this is that this is a more interactive or as an interactive as we can get with a virtual uh, experience. And so we'll be using Zoom, right? You can see me, you can see the slides. Um, I'll be watching Zoom chat, so feel free uh, to give comments along the way in there and I'll weave that in. Uh, and then as well, use the Zoom q and I'll be looking at that. We will have some time towards the end to ask some questions, uh, but also as we go along, I may bring some questions in uh, along the way and make this a little bit more interactive uh, as, as much as we can. And then I'm also going to be using a tool called Mentimeter. Um, and so Mentimeter is this really good uh, online polling thing. I'm going to have some audience participation uh, along the way. And so uh, if I actually just go to the next page, what you'll see is a QR code that you can take a picture of with your mobile phone uh, and just follow a little bit along and participate that way. You could go to a browser. Uh, don't turn off your uh, business over breakfast browser, to be clear. Uh, you need to hear me and see me. Uh, but this can sort of be a second browser or whatnot um, and answer the questions as they come. Uh, and we'll see how that, that works as we go along the way. And then on every question, you'll see the code again. So again, feel free to take a picture of the QR code on your mobile phone, and then you can answer the questions as we go. All right. So empathy is one of those things uh, that means so many different things to people. We're going to try to define it together a little bit. 
But before we really go there, I have a question for you in the Minty sort of spot, style. And so go ahead and log in. And the first question is how customer focused is your organization today? I'd love to know what you think. Are you very customer focused? Are you pretty good? Are you okay? Are you somewhat? Are you not at all? Is this a trick question? So as those, as those numbers start to come in, I wanna connect empathy and customer focused, right? We often say that yes, we're customer focused, but what does that really mean? Does it mean we talk to our customers a lot? Does it mean we hear from them when there's a problem? Does it mean we are going out proactively and engaging people and listening to not just what they say about our organization, but what they say around our organization? Where are we on that? So great. So we've got a little bit of participation. So thank you for that, without a doubt. And so, you know, a lot of people saying good, You fit over 50% saying good. We do talk to them regularly and we're pretty sure we know what they need. That's awesome. And look, let's also be clear, right? Um, you're never done with this. And it's not like if you're at somewhat that you're terrible at all. I think the thing we have to think about is how do we move from right to left and do more? And I'm hopeful that the empathy uh, conversation that we're gonna have today will help us do that. Awesome. All right, let's go to one more. And now we're gonna make it a little bit more specific to empathy. Oops, oops, here we go. Hopefully I didn't mess that up by going two slides. How good are you at getting customer empathy? How good are you at getting customer empathy? And I'm really talking about you specifically. Are you great? Oh my gosh, I do this for real. You're holding out on me. You're a user experience researcher that does this for a living. Maybe, might be some of those in the audience. Uh, are you, uh, you know, hey, I can have conversations. Hey, I, can, I do it sometimes, but I'd love to learn more uh, and whatnot. So those are the things that I'm just sort of curious where people are. And that this isn't to say that every one of us needs to be as good as a UX researcher to do empathy, right? We have those. I have some of those on my staff uh, at Deluxe Corporation, and they're amazing at what they do. I'm not one. Uh, and so I would probably rank myself as pretty good at this. Great. So we've got some people who are actually quite good. Awesome. Hopefully you learned something, or if not, help me teach the course as we go through this morning. Uh, you have a bunch of people who say, I'm pretty good. I know what to ask. Uh, maybe I don't do it as much as I like. Maybe I could use some tips and tricks. And then some who are not good, right? And this is something that uh, they either want to or could get better at. Awesome. So now what I want to do is actually talk a little bit about empathy. But before we really just go into empathy, I actually thought really what I'd rather do is actually do a little case study. So again, a little bit more audience participation. So for this morning, we're gonna do a little case study. So imagine that you are part of a design team for a conglomerate of car dealerships, right? You own some car dealerships, you sell cars, you service cars, et cetera. And the project I'm going to give you for the next couple minutes is to redesign the car maintenance experience. We all have cars, uh, maybe not all of us, but many of us have cars. Many of us are used to that uh, car maintenance experience. So what I really wanna do to get started is what could you do to improve the car maintenance experience? I'd love you to add that in Minty. If for whatever reason Minty isn't working for you or you'd rather not, go ahead and put it in chat. That's totally fine. But what would you do to improve the car maintenance experience? What are some things you'd think about doing? How would you make it better for everybody out there? And I'm gonna go ahead and show this answers. Great technicians and good service, awesome. Transparency, clear communication, treat everyone with respect. Love it, focus on why the customer showed up today. Aggr aggressive training, oops, let me see if I can not scroll quite so quick. There we go, make it an independent entity, not part of a dealership. Easy communication, Tracy says in chat, Pick my car up from my house, adhere to appointments, easy booking, faster service, says Tracy. Transparency and price competition, says Francisco. Upfront pricing, man, you guys are good. I love the rapid fire ideas of what we could do to make the, add a chip to the auto. There you go, do it at my house, love it, awesome. So great. So the question I would ask you as we sort of think about this is who are we designing for? Right, I just ask you the question of how to improve it. Who are we designing for? And one of the things we have to think about 
is as humans, we love to jump to solutions. We love to jump to the answers. I've got this and I've got this and do this. And wouldn't that be great if you did that? And that is awesome. However, that's not really an empathy led. <laughs> Al, <laughs> all these sound like Mercedes. I, I got to tell you, more and more companies are getting better at this. I've been using this exercise for about 10 years or so, uh, and they've definitely gotten better at it. But what we really want to do in design thinking or using empathy is not jump to the solution. We really want to understand our customer even better. So what I'm going to do now in design thinking, and this is sort of the process, we'll talk about this in a little bit, but before we get to solving the solution in ideate prototype and test, one of the things we really like to do is to go deep with empathy. And that's what I really want to show you today uh, uh, with what does empathy look like? So as, as good as those ideas were, which I appreciate, now what I want to do is flip us from our own perspective to someone else's. So what I'm going to do is actually show you what an empathy interview looks like. A quick one, five to seven minutes, not too long, but I want to show you. And what I want you to do as we go through this is I want you to pay attention to what is important to Pat. So Pat's going to join us in just a second. And here's my ask. Play the role of an imposter ethnographer. An ethnographer is someone who studies people for a living, right? They're phenomenal at this. They're amazing at this. I am not an ethnographer. You might be holding out on me. Maybe you are, but let's pretend you're not. And most of you aren't. I want you to play the role of an imposter ethnographer. And as we go through this interview, I want you to pay attention to what is important to Pat. What is important to Pat? Pat, do we have you? I think so. Awesome. I can see you. I can hear you. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, we're excited to have you. Good morning. Glad to be here. All right, Pat. So maybe we'll just start easy. Tell us just a little bit about yourself, your family, your work situation, your living situation, just so we can get to know you a little bit. Great. So I uh, live here in Sandy Springs, um, and I know here is relative to a virtual meeting, but <laughs> uh, Sandy Springs outside of Atlanta. And uh, I have uh, a three-year-old. So it's my wife and uh, son, Billy, who's uh, a wild child. Um, and uh, I work uh, in product management. Uh, and, you know, I, I love to play golf. And I'm very happy that it's master's uh, weekend and looking forward to that. Awesome. Very, very good. Tell us about your vehicle situation. You have a car or a couple cars. Tell me just a little bit about that so we can orient ourselves. Yeah. So uh, we have two cars, one uh, Subaru Forester and one Subaru Ascent. Okay. You're a big Subaru fan, clearly. Uh, yeah, you know, it, it, <laughs> my uh, my wife and I kind of look at cars as big appliances, um, and so we care more about reliability and uh, safety and uh, those types of things. And we used to live in Columbus, Ohio, where there was snow and all-wheel drive was uh, important, and uh, we really we got the um, Forrester when we were up there and we like Subarus. And so um, I have a soft spot for Subarus because I also had the Subaru Baja when I was in high school. Oh, nice. I don't know if anybody remembers that car, but- That uh, was the I, El Camino pickup truck car, uh -huh. thing, right? Yeah. I miss that car dearly. It is living with my cousin out in California right now, which is where it should be. <laughs> um, so- <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so we, we, we just, uh, we look at them as just help us get from point A to point B safely. That's great. Well, what I really want to understand is an experience you've had taking your car in for service. Can, so can you tell me about maybe the last time you took your car in for service, one of those cars in for service and what that experience was like? Yeah, yeah, I can. Uh, it was in January and, um, my, uh, it was the the Forester, which is the car I drive, um, and I needed a, an oil change. And we had just we have so we moved to Sandy Springs about a year and a half ago. So in that time, we haven't like really built up like our trusted mechanic or trusted you know resources for a couple different things. So 
um, a little bit of this is, you know, we were just going with, uh, you know, who was right down the street from us and um, went there. Um, they had good reviews online. So we went there and dropped my car off just for an oil change. And um, and I, I got uh, the call that uh, I had tire rot in all four tires. Okay. So. So tell me about, you said, I got the call. Yeah. Tell me when you say that, what does that mean? And how are you feeling? That's really interesting. Well, so I dropped the car off and I wasn't, you know, I, I lived right down the street from where I dropped it off. So I just walked home and uh, instead of waiting in the little waiting area they had. Um, and I was assuming I was going to get a call to, um, you know, come pick up my car. But when I, when I answered the phone, it was more of, well, we need to talk to you about something than, you know, Pat, your car's ready. Right. <laughs> um, and so it was, you know, it, it was, I mean, you know, you know, it happens, right. Cause you have horror stories from other people taking their car to mechanic. And then all of a sudden it's, you know, a big ticket item when you thought it was just an oil change, but um, so that, that's why that's why I, I, I it was it was more in, in hindsight that I realized that that's what it was than um, in the in the moment I thought I, I thought I was just getting the call to get my car picked up and then I got the call to say you owe us you know or you need to replace all of your tires and it's going to be twelve hundred dollars. Yikes! So what were you feeling at that time? Like what was going on in your head as you're thinking about the, Hey, it's tire rot, which I didn't know there was such a thing. And it's $1,200. Like, what are you thinking at the time? Well, so, so two things. One, you, you said what I, one of the things I was feeling, one was I didn't know tires could rot. And so I felt a little embarrassed that <laughs> I, uh, you know, kind of have these machines in the driveway that, uh, you know, are important for us to, to get around because you can't really live in Atlanta without a car. Um, and obviously tires are important. And he, the way he made it sound like was like, everybody should know what tire rot is. <laughs> like, he just sort of said it like, you have tire rot. Like, okay, I, I, uh, I, don't, I don't know what that is. I don't know how dangerous I'm assuming. It sounds dangerous. So, so that led to the second feeling, which was, how long was I oblivious to a problem with my car that, you know, I'm driving around with my three-year-old in the car seat in the back and potentially in a, in a dangerous situation that, that did not make me feel good. Yeah. Um, so I was, I was a little embarrassed. I didn't know what was going on. And then I was kind of disappointed in myself for what, uh, you know, what kind of situation I was unaware that I was in. Yeah. So great. You get the call. They tell you this. What happens next? I pay $1,200 because I'm not going to drive around with tire rot. I got, I, and I, I, you know, it was, I don't, <laughs> this sort of sounds maybe a little bit worse, but it kind of feels like they're holding you hostage a little bit because they got your car up on the thing, right? Changing the oil. And I can't take it anywhere because, you know, they're still in the middle of their job. Yeah. And like, am I going to just say like, no, give me my car back and I'm going to take it away when you said it was, you know, I had this problem. Like it, it just, I didn't really feel like I had a choice. Okay. So it was just, yeah, do it. And so I, I am the proud owner of four new tires now. <laughs> All right. So then what happened? So you said, go ahead and do it, right? You got off the phone. Then what happened? Then a couple hours later, they call me up. Car is all set. Everything's great. I walk over there. I pay the tab and, you know, the, you know, they, they were plenty nice. Like it wasn't like they were, you know, jerks about it. <laughs> it was, you know very um you know they were very friendly in the service it was just um you know that was just 
no, it was a very unexpected thing. And, but I got the car back and it's fine now, but, um, it just makes me wonder what else am I not aware of? Cause I'm not a car guy. Um, so, um, yeah. Yeah. Let, so I don't, let me ask you this. Um, you said when they said tire rot and you didn't know what that was and you said you were embarrassed, was there anything you did to figure out what tire rot was? How, like, how did you come to know what tire rot was? Right. Uh, did you talk to them or did you just sort of let it go? Like, help me understand sort of if you did anything to uh, on that perspective. I Googled it. OK. Um, you find anything so I, interesting? I <laughs> learned something. <laughs> um, but no, I mean, it didn't really like it, it didn't really. Because it was like he calls me, he says, you got tire rot like I didn't hang up with him, Google it. Yeah. And then, you know, um, call him back and say, okay, yeah, now uh, go ahead and change them. Cause I looked it up and I think that this is worth doing. Right. Um, so I, it, it was, it was all, you know, he was in the shop, I was at home. And so I wasn't e able to like, you know, I guess I could have gone in and taking a look at it but I don't know anything about cars so even if I did like I don't I wouldn't know exactly what I was looking at so I kind of have to take his word for it anyway right um that's interesting well let me ask you this you mentioned that you walked home and mm -hmm. then you walked back now let's be honest for those who don't know Atlanta that's a rare experience but tell me what why was <laughs> it important to walk home Wh why did you choose to walk home I think you said instead of waiting there tell me a little bit about what that was uh yeah i mean they they had you know a, a old looking coffee pot and a beat up leather couch um and i had some work to do and so uh it was a it was a nice enough day uh cuz it was january and in atlanta and it was you know about 45 degrees and i'm a northerner so like that stuff's great for me like i, I love uh you know, those, those, that, that type of weather in January. So um, it's about a mile from my house. So I just walked. Um, it was a nice little walk. Listen to a podcast, you know, it was, I, I, it was time for myself that I don't take enough. So it's sort of like forced time to do something that like I might not have otherwise done if I wasn't, um, you know, without any other option. That's great. So. That's awesome. What, um, maybe just last question, as you were walking back uh, to that after the whole tire rot thing and whatnot, do you remember what you were thinking and feeling uh, on that walk back as you were headed back to pick up your car? Yeah, I, I, um, I was annoyed, um, but it was, let's see, we, we got the car in 20, 17 and i think this was the first time we other than like rotating tires like we hadn't gotten any new tires on it since 20, 20 2018 so i have no like again it was just sort of like this moment of like what am i like just not paying attention to with my car because i don't really i think about it like i think about my refrigerator um and so it was just like, it, you know, one of those things where it was like, should I start paying better attention to things than I do? And um, so it was, it, was a, it was a very reflective walk because I didn't, you know, I had gotten over the like annoyance that I had to pay this because I realized like, oh, I guess it's been a while. And I, you know, I, I'm not an idiot. I know you need new tires at some point. Right. Right. <laughs> um, but uh so it was more of like that ref like reflection on what am i doing wrong type stuff like you know how can i how can i not have this happen again and not be caught flat-footed again yeah um so it's great so what we then did was we went and changed the tires on my wife's car <laughs> is that right yeah oh, interesting um why why did you do that because we, you know, 
it, it we got her card used and um we don't know like what like when the last time they were changed was so we were like let's just get both of our tire both of our cars we have two new sets of tires so we like can be in sync with where we are in, in tire usage. In tire usage, in the tire journey. Awesome. Pat, thank you a ton for spending a little time with us and going through this empathy interview. Really appreciate it. Uh, appreciate your time. Feel free to drop, but uh, let's get uh, let's get going through the rest of the webinar. Thanks, Pat. Yeah, thanks, Scott. See you later. All right, sounds good. Awesome. Thank you, guys. All right, so that's an empathy interview. So before we sort of unpack what the empathy interview looks like, Let's really go to the next part, which is um, what was important to Pat? Now, there's a tendency to want to jump to solve it for him, right? To say, oh, do this and do that and do that. I don't want you to do that yet. What I want you to talk about is what is important to Pat, right? And so we're going to do another Minty. So again, feel free to put it in Minty. Feel free to put it in chat. And I'll start to read some of those things as well. Like what is important to Pat? What did you hear? that you think is important to Pat. Safety and reliability, love that one, absolutely. And there was this fear, reliability and safety, awesome. There was this fear that am I doing enough to protect my family? Awesome, and I see family a few times, feel safe, right? There was a lot around feel safe, I love it, right? Time, trust and respect, right? Absolutely, I think that's good. Convenience, the fact that, <laughs> excuse me, the fact that he could walk there and walk back, was really, really helpful. Having all the information, like what was going on? Like he felt embarrassed, right? That he didn't know what tire rot was. I'll be honest with you. <laughs> I don't actually know what tire rot is either. So maybe I have some learning to do as well. But what else did he, what else was important to him? Visibility. Uh, so Cynthia in, in the chat, great visibility. Feeling informed, feeling good about the experience. <laughs> Fresh coffee. Love it. We got to keep ourselves hydrated. I love that. Absolutely. So then let me ask sort of this question as you're thinking about this. What was what was he looking for out of a car dealership? Or what's he looking for out of a car service place? What is important to him in a car service place? What did you hear? Ah, Carlos, trusting. Trusting a, stange, a stranger, right? I think that's really good, the trust there. I think he had said we hadn't built up our trusted resources yet right? Because we had just moved to, to that, that new house and that new location. Trustworthiness, right? Trusting that someone who knew more would advise honestly. Awesome. A and also ability to service the Supero brand. Absolutely. Awesome. So I think that's a really good one. Um, what else was important to him? What else did you hear along the way? Someone who understands his point of view? Ah, Rebecca, the car's an appliance to him. What do I need to do to make sure what proactive maintenance do I do so that I don't have to worry about that? I love that. Being proactive with solutions. Great. How can I make sure that I don't run into a problem? Because I even felt as I was talking to them, there was a little bit of the future, but there was a little bit of, oh my gosh, what just happened over the last three or six months where tire rot could have actually hurt me and hurt my family? Right, so there was a little bit of look forward. There was a little bit of look back uh, as well. I love that. Yeah, what else have I missed? I think that was a really interesting one. He said that a couple times. What else could I do? What else have I missed? Right, which makes me think that he, he wants to learn. He wants to be educated a little bit about how he can make sure this appliance keeps working for him and his family. Like, I think it's one thing to think about a refrigerator not working but a whole nother thing to think about the car and your family and the safety, right? And those types of things. That's awesome. And I love, great. This is a great one to end on. One of the things we like to do in empathy interviews is pay attention to those magic words. Man, holding him hostage was an amazing set of words that really makes me think about, gosh, how could we make sure that as we redesign the car maintenance experience, we don't hold people hostage? How do we give them the chances to make choices, to give them the options, as someone just said, to make that happen? These are all really interesting uh, elements and learnings from what we just learned in a quick seven minute empathy interview. Great, thank you all for the participation. But here's what maybe what I wanna do as we sort of talk about this um, is, actually before I do that, um, what did you notice about the empathy interview? Or what did you notice about the type of needs that we got 
from the empathy interview versus the things we were saying before the empathy interview. And just put it in the chat if you've got it, right? What did you notice about what we learned as we just went through that whole laundry list of needs that were different than the before? Jacqueline, feelings are key. Great. One of the things we find with innovation is that yes, it's about the function, but second, it's about the emotion as well. Both of those matter a lot. And it's our job as designers to go understand not just the functional benefits, but the emotional journey they go on that can actually help us unlock that. Adrian talks about listening skills are important. Look, you know, in a normal conversation, we talk, I talk, he talks, we, I talk, we talk. Hopefully what you noticed is he was talking the vast majority of the time, right? And think about it. People's favorite subject to talk about is themselves. So in an empathy interview, we let them. Listening skills are super important without a doubt. And Cynthia, absolutely trying to think about that whole experience. The other thing I would point out, oh, I love Deborah, awesome, right? Don't assume they know our jargon. In fact, if you heard some of the questions I asked, I used his words back at him. Tell me about that you were embarrassed. Tell me about the tire rot. Tell me about, you know, I asked him to use his words as they figure this out. Awesome. So let's talk a little bit more about empathy and what it is. So empathy is a deep understanding of the person for whom you're designing. You're trying to get to know them better than they know themselves. That's what you're really trying to do. Why? Because what we are trying to do is we are trying to not just understand the needs they can express and tell us, I need this. We are trying to understand their latent, latent needs. These are the needs they can't express, but that are there. And it's our job to get that out of them. And I will be honest, it's more in the latent needs where we can actually understand the big opportunities for innovation. But it takes time, it takes work. They're never just gonna say, hey, this is my need, go do it. Very seldom do you get that. We have to use this tool of empathy to understand those latent needs, right? Exactly, they may not have the words to express that, Deborah. That's exactly right, right? And so we have to pull that out of them, maybe not so that they say it, and we have to do some amount of synthesis afterwards to find those latent needs. That's the power of empathy to find those and unlock those. So. What do we have to do? This is where one of the biggest challenges for adults is. My kids have learned design thinking and man, they go in with the mindset of a child. We as adults have to go in with the mindset of a child. We have to go in without judgment. We have to go without our knowledge. All of this great expertise we've got, all of this great knowledge we've got actually gets in our way with empathy because we think we know the answer. We think we know the world works. And so what I would ask you to think about in empathy is put all of that great experience to the side, go in with this mindset of a child, assume you don't know what they mean, assume you don't know what the answers are, assume you don't know anything about this, and then learn and open yourself up to learning as deeply as you can. It takes a special kind of person to do this because we like being experts. We like being good at something. And so we think that can get, we think that can solve us. But remember, if I ask you to go solve something, you'll do it. What we want to take is an empathetic approach to do that and use that mindset of a child. And then how do we go do it? Ideally, we go where they are, right? In this post-COVID world, it gets a little more challenging. <laughs> Although my team is going out again next week to some auto parts dealerships, funnily enough, uh, that was not intentionally connected to this design challenge. But ideally, we go where they are. Going virtually, going where they are virtually is also good. We were able to see Pat in his home, right? Which is really, really good along the way, right? Go where they are. Al, I'll come back to your question in just a second. I love the question. Give me just a second. I'll come back to it. So first, we go where they are. Then we watch and observe them. Ideally, we would have been at the car dealership when Pat walked in, and we would have seen some interactions. Ideally, we would have been listening on that phone call, the call he got as well, right? Ideally, we would have watched this happen because what we find is that what people say to us and what they do might be different. And so remember, you're looking for latent needs along the way. And so the say-do difference is what we call it, what they tell us and what they actually do. If there's a difference there, that's really key. I'll give you one quick example. 
A few years ago, I was doing some work in e-commerce shopping and we asked people, do you have a problem with passwords? Everybody said no. But when we watched them shop, every single one of them actually reset their password while we were watching them, right? And so they just don't know these things. And so it's our job to bring that out. Watch and observe. And number three, we engage and talk to them, right? And that's what you saw me do. You saw me run an empathy interview. And I'll bring that to life a little bit more for you. An empathy interview is about having a conversation, right? It's about asking questions. And I think as Deborah or somebody said, it's about talking about feelings, right? And we ask why a lot. You heard me ask why a lot. You've heard of the five whys. It's that kind of thing. But we're also seeking stories, past real stories. The best indicator of future behavior is past behavior. <clears throat> so I didn't want to talk to Pat about what do you usually do when you take your car in? I wanted to get super specific on a real story, right? That allowed us to figure that out, right? And so I sought stories along the way and I got a good story and I was able to then get deeper into that story. And the other thing you saw me do is to ask some of these open-ended questions. Tell me about the last time you took your car in, right? Why is that? Can you tell me more about that? What did you mean by this? And I'm using open-ended questions with their words or these generic words so that I can really understand more deeply. And then finally, capture findings. And I don't know if you could tell, but I was doing a bunch of uh, capturing of uh, my notes. And what I was writing down was quotes. I wasn't writing down a solution. I wasn't writing down the synthesis I was doing. I'm writing down quotes because ideally what you do is you talk to a handful of people, right? And that's really maybe what this slide is all about is you talk to a handful of people and you look for patterns. And that's what we're trying to do. This was just one empathy interview to sort of demonstrate the capability. You get that, right? One of the questions I often get is, do I have to talk to everybody? And the short answer is no. Right. The reality is, if you talk to six to eight people that are in a given cell, I'm not going to get into marketing research theory here, but in a given cell that have similar characteristics of demographics and revenue that are sort of in one of your target segments, you can if you get talk to six to eight people, you can get 80 percent of the learnings as if you talk to everybody statistically proven. And I can find if you're interested, I'll find the study that's there. Don't feel like you got to talk to everybody talk to a handful and get the patterns, and then you can go through the design thinking cycles. Now, Al ask a question, which is a really good one that I just wanted to hit. If you aren't able to do these things at your organization, whether because of time, uh, skills, or resources, assume it's okay to outsource the empathy gathering. I would say two things to that question, Al. One is, um, yes, without a doubt. Look, at the end of the day, you do want people who know how to do this to do this. That being said, secondly, I would encourage you to go on the empathy interviews. There's a huge difference between getting the report back from an outsourced vendor and actually getting the report back, but having gone on it, you will learn a whole level of things. That outsourced vendor is never gonna know your business or your organization as well as you do. So think of it less as an outsource more as a, they can run the sessions, right? But we're gonna be there and we're gonna participate in every other part, but they can run the interviews, but it really should be more of a tag team because it's really gonna be your job to uncover those latent needs. David asked a good question. Appreciate that, David. When you say patterns, do I mean common denominators? It's a really good question. Um, and let me see if I can articulate it. I partially mean common denominators. What is common? across them. But here's the difference. And that's why I don't love the word common denominators. Common denominators assume sort of there's everybody's base need and that's what you want to solve for them. What I like to find is those unique needs that are super interesting. Held hostage. That for me, you know, that might not be a, a everybody might not say it, right? But that's a really good articulation of it that one of those people said and then I might really try to design an experience around how might we not help, uh, how might we help them not feel that they're held hostage? Because even though the other people couldn't articulate it, right? Um, maybe Pat could, 
and we want to build from that. So I would just be careful with common denominator. You're still looking for unique and surprising insights along the way, but yes, you're looking for patterns as well. And so if I were to go talk to six or other people, right, along the way, if they have elements of held hostage, though they didn't say that, that still might be super interesting for me to build. And then Amy, to Amy's point, these quotes that we're capturing um, are amazing at building the story, right? Because I could sit here and tell you 37% of people have a need around X or Y, but when I tell you the story of Pat, and I tell you a story of that phone call, that can be a great galvanizing thing to bring your organization along. I love that. And then David, just to hit the, the eight people might have different stories. So yes, that's right. But you're looking for the commonalities across. And you'll be surprised as you do this, you'll start to see some commonalities pretty quickly. Again, let me be clear. It is hard to actually figure out what those unique insights are. Otherwise, everybody would be doing it, right? Without a doubt. Um, but how do we actually think about that becomes really important. And so one of the things we teach, and I have a couple courses later this year, is great, you've got some really interesting insights. How do you take them forward? And that's really where design thinking comes in, as you take some of those insights and test some of those. Because just doing an empathy interview isn't the end. Empathy is an input to the larger design thinking process. And then it's super iterative to not just iterate the solution, but also iterate the problem. So let me wrap up empathy. And again, be thinking of more questions as you go and feel free to put them in, in a chat or Q&A. So just to sort of wrap this sort of part on empathy, look, empathy is not thinking you're a user and can design from your experience. This is what I call the expert model of innovation. And I've seen it be, I've seen it really struggle to get to revolutionary or game-changing things, even incremental things. We know too much, we need to flip our perspective. It's also not asking the user to design for you. They can't. They can't imagine a world that's so different from today. That's our job to design it. What we're trying to do in empathy is to take those learnings and then springboard from that. Empathy is also not going in with what you think is the answer and trying to validate it. If you're familiar with uh, conscious bias, that's exact or confirmation bias, that's exactly what that is. You go in thinking you know the answer, and guess what? When you hear all the research, right, or all of the great quotes, you process them that way. This is where the mindset of a child is so key. Okay, so what I thought I would do as we wrap to, as we head towards a few more questions, is just tell you another story of how empathy can be really, really powerful in unlocking innovation from your customers. So I'm gonna tell you a little story about Embrace. Um, at Stanford, I'm also on the faculty at Stanford, and we have a class called Design for Extreme Affordability. And this class is all about in developing countries, they don't have the resources, the money, the investment to actually solve problems in the way we might in a developed country. So how can you dramatically redesign things in a situation where you have to dramatically reduce the cost? All right, so that's the class. So I'm gonna tell you a little story about Jane. Jane was a Stanford student. She came to Stanford, she took this class uh, among other classes of design thinking. And she got really inspired uh, to really solve a problem. And she got a small team together in this class and they went to solve a problem around infant mortality in developing worlds, uh, in developing countries, sorry, in developing countries. The, the percentage of babies that die every year in developing countries is absolutely astronomical. And she said, I wanna do something about that. So in this class, they work with NGOs or non-governmental organizations. And one of the NGOs that she worked with said, great, this is awesome. We believe the problem is this. Anybody know what this is? Put it in chat. Anybody know what this is and what it's designed to do? Incubator, sterile, keep babies alive. You guys got it, love it. You guys are on it. I appreciate that. It is an incubator. And its purpose, <coughs> a baby alive machine, Angie, honestly, I love, love that frame. And then Derek says, keep them warm and sterile. That's exactly right. Interestingly enough, its job is actually to maintain the temperature, not exactly keep them warm, but same principle, right? Absolutely keep them warm. And um, by the way, these things cost about $15,000, right? Really, really expensive, um, without a doubt. And they cost about $15,000 and they break a lot and they're expensive to fix. 
So the NGO worked, talked to Jane and was like, what we really would like for you to do is to design a baby incubator, right? That actually, instead of cost 15 or 20,000, cost $200 from 20,000 to $200. That's the extreme affordability part of this. And so what Jane did is they started to use this design thinking process that we've been talking about to build it. And here's a prototype, not a real baby. So don't, don't get worried, right? Not a real baby. We're prototyping it, uh, a doll. But you see it. It's sort of a Walmart plastic shopping bin. Uh, I think there's, there's some cardboard. And I think one of them is a koozie, right? A beer koozie and whatnot. And they were just starting to prototype. How can we dramatically change and reduce the cost to a big degree? So that's what they did. So they started to prototype. But as we all just talked about, empathy is a huge part of innovation. So they got on a plane, they went to Nepal uh, and to visit some clinics in Nepal, and they talked to the doctors and the, um, the workers at the clinic. And everybody said, absolutely, this is a problem. If you could give us a cheaper incubator, that would be absolutely amazing. But as the team watched and observed, they saw a couple things. They saw several baby incubators around the clinics that they visited. They were working and they were empty. So they said, what's going on? And they asked the question, what, why are these empty? You know, when you, you just got finished telling me that we don't have enough of them and whatnot. And, you know, the doctors and the clinicians said, well, that's just, it's unique. It's a different time. Don't worry about it. That's still the problem. But the team wasn't satisfied with that. And one of the things they did is they jumped on a bus and they actually took the bus outside of the city. And that's where they stumbled on their insight. It turns out that 80% of premature and low birth weight babies are born hours away from the hospital, right? And so that's what they found. And so they realized that the prob the user was not the clinicians and the doctors at the clinics. The user was the mom in these remote villages, right? And the problem was not keep the baby warm at the clinic. The real problem was keep the baby warm on the way to the hospital so the baby has a chance at surviving, right? Get the flip, right? That flip of perspective, because it turns out by the time a lot of these kids got to the, got to the clinics in the cities, it was too late. So they said, well, gosh, we could solve that, right? And they did some more prototyping, again, not with real babies until they got somewhere, and they created Embrace, right? Embrace is a different solution for a different problem, right? It wasn't about the clinicians. It was about the moms. It wasn't about to keep them warm at the clinic. It was about keep them warm on the way to the clinic along the way. And they created what is basically a sleep, baby sleeping bag, if you will. It's made out of a phase change material that actually most material, when you heat it, it immediately gets cooler. This material, you heat it and it stays constant for several hours, and then you can plug it in or heat it with boiling water or whatnot, right? Their goal is to save 5 million babies over the next five years, but they wouldn't have gotten to this game-changing innovation without watching and observing and doing the interviews along the way to unlock something that reframed the problem. And that, in a nutshell, is what empathy allows us to do. And so just to complete the picture, they did empathy. They defined the problem. Their original problem statement was keep the baby warm at the clinic. They reframed it to keep the baby warm on the way to the clinic. Huge redefinition of the problem. They didn't get there initially. They brainstormed, they prototyped, they tested, and they iterated over and over and over again. And maybe here's the thing I would ask you to think about when we talk about design thinking and innovation. So much of innovation innovates the how, the program, the app, the product, the service. Great. That's half of the battle. The other half, we have to iterate the who and the what. Who are we solving for and what are their needs? And that's really where, where, where um, uh, empathy comes in. So let me ask one more question uh, on Menti. So now I'd ask you to think about how customer focused is your organization today? Now that we've gone through that and we sort of brought to life empathy, did your vote change? Are you better? Are you worse? I'd love your thoughts on sort of where you are today and what it looks like.
And by the way, there have been some great comments in chat. So thank you all for participating in that. We're going to go to some questions in just a second as well. So feel free to put some questions in there or in Q&A. But there have been some really good comments and questions along the way to actually encourage some of this type of behavior. So great. So 9% of you, 8% of you are in the very 38, 36, 40 percent of you are in the sort of the good. That's a little bit lower than where we are. I think several of you have shifted down to okay and somewhat. Fine, right? Remember, this isn't about where I. It's not about where I am today. It's about how do you go forward. Thank you, Al. By the way, it's about how you go forward and how do we get better and better at doing this. All right. So. Questions. I would love any other questions in these last four or five minutes, right? That you've got of how do you do this for real? And then I'll give you one more thing and then we'll wrap. Any questions that come to mind that you want to ask that sort of get at how do you do empathy or any other helpful hint you'd want to share with everyone else? Oh, Raymond, yes. Empathy is not a sign of weakness. In fact, I would argue that if we can get really good at it, it's actually a strength and a superpower that we can leverage. Scott, I've got a yeah. question. Um, Please. Um, do we need to gain empathy for all of our customers? That seems like it would take a lot of time. And is it is it worth it to do it across the board with all customers? Yeah, it's a really good question, Nicola. Thank you for that. Um, I would say a couple of things. One, no, and don't try. Over time, you'll talk to more and more, um, but talk to a handful first and you might be surprised what you learn. And so this doesn't mean that quantitative research is a bad thing. I love quant. Absolutely. I want to know if 37% of people think this or think that and whatnot. But I use qual, which is this is more qualitative research, for something different than I use quant. Qual qualitative like empathy allows me to go deep and understand the needs. Then I can ask the questions in the quant. And so the quant helps me get to a sizable and a, a, a good enough size, our customers and even prospects, but the qual allows me to go deep. So use qual to go deep with a handful, use quant to get more of a statistical sizing. They work together, both are important. I just see more organizations spend more of their time trying to get to every customer, where I would actually say, try to get to a few deeply, and you'll be surprised what you learned. And then from there, Scott, do you start to create personas for those types of customers, for those types of, of users? Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, and so what you want to do is you start to engage people, you'll start to say, well, they're this type of person and they're this type of person. And so we create personas or, or highlights or whatever you want to or composite, uh, composite people, composite characters, et cetera. The thing I would just encourage as you do this is don't lose the specificity of some of these users that inspired you. That held hostage comment from the Pat interview, I think is a really powerful one. What a lot of people do when they shift to personas is they start to genericize because marketing needs more of a, uh, you know, a more demographic, psychographic type of experience. We can't lose the specifics of that. Thanks. Couple, couple other good questions. Uh, Cynthia, what are the main tools to use when conducting <laughs> design thinking? There are a bunch of tools out there without a doubt. Some of the ones, you know, I just use the open-ended question, but you can map a journey, right? The journey map is a really good tool. An empathy map, what did they say? What do they think? What do they do? What do they feel <laughs> are really good. Go Google empathy design, empathy tools, and you'll see a lot more. I would just encourage you that just that power of open-ended interviews with follow-ups and asking why, I would really start there um, as well. All right, uh, another question, um, and maybe I'll take one or two more, Nicola, and then we can wrap. Um, let's see, how can we apply empathy to an unhappy customer with a delivered product that has failed to repair or design the product? So thank you for the question. So I would say this, look, at the end of the day, Customers, whether it's a failed product or an existing, they love to be talked to. And so go ask questions, not in a judgmental way, but tell me about why this product failed for you. Tell me about why you're unhappy. Tell me about the last time you used it. Who does a better job? And so to extract learnings, I think that's a really good way to do it. You might actually start to change their mind as well, which is good, but you may not. 
And so remember, empathy is not about selling. It's not about convincing. It is about learning, right? And that's what we really try to do along the way. How do we actually learn from that? And so if you go in with that mindset of a child and a learner's mindset, you'll learn things. I don't know if you'll turn an unhappy customer to a happy customer, but I'll be honest, just engaging them goes a long way to actually helping them think, it, goes a long way to actually helping them think about those types of things. So let me wrap here and let me just say one more thing, which is my encouragement of all of you is not to go do a big design thinking study yet, not to go do a bunch of empathy interviews, what we find in this type of work, and it gets at some of the other questions, right, is big change comes from small changes in behavior. So I have one homework assignment for you that you can choose to do. Go find a customer and deeply through empathy. Ask an open-ended question and then listen to understand not to solve. Don't worry if they're not the perfect customer. Don't worry if they're not quite in your cell. If they're a friend or a family member, great. Just go have an open-ended conversation and focus on learning and listening, not on solving. And just think about, you know, tell me about the last time you, whatever it is that's most appropriate for your experience. Go try it, go see it, and I wish you all the luck in the world in applying empathy. Nicola? Actually, Tammy. Tammy. Over to you. Thanks, Scott. Hi, thank you, Scott. That was really, really great. Um, a lot of good information. I think that last bit that you added uh, about listening to understand and not to solve, I think a lot of us get into that rhythm and really want to go and solve the problem. But I think it's really great to hear that we really need to listen um, and uh, ask those open-ended questions. Um, so thank you very much for this session. We really appreciate it. Uh, so looking ahead, um, please join us on April the 20th for uh, a transparency statement improves interactions across power disparities with Andrea Dittman. And then looking ahead even further on May the 4th, why behavior science hasn't been working for you and what you can do about it with Ryan Hamilton. So we hope to see you on one or both of those uh, Business Over Breakfast webinars. Um, and as always, we'd like to definitely share with you our upcoming uh, short courses through executive education. Um, executive Communication Leadership Presence will take place on April the 18th and 19th. So if you're interested in learning more about how to communicate across, up and down within your organizations and leading teams better, we definitely would love to see you in this course. Uh, we also have our AI and machine learning for business. This is a great interactive course, uh, very non-technical, but will give you the foundations that you need to understand AI and machine learning and be able to communicate with technical um, teamwork, team uh, players within your organizations. Uh, this course is taking place on April the 24th and 25th. This is also in person. And finally, we want to invite you to our Guzueta Executive Women's Leadership Program. This program is a hybrid option. It takes place from August the 15th through September the 21st. Um, and there are in-person as well as virtual components of this program. Um, we are accepting applications. So please, if you have questions about any of these programs or any of our other short courses, please feel free to reach out to us at the web address here, or you can send me an email directly to tammy.long at emory.edu. And with that, we want to say thank you again for joining us today and wish you a great rest of your week. Take care and have a great rest of your day.